Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Galatians chapter 3. And what we're going to do today is really the core of how I study the Bible, how I see the Bible, how I think the Bible tells us to study the Bible. And that is, uh, number one, Paul said we compare spiritual things with spiritual things, uh, which then we are comparing one place in the Bible with another place in the Bible, because that's the way the Holy Ghost teaches us. And Paul warns us against getting man's wisdom. In other words, man would take one thing out of the Bible and then compare it with something outside of the Bible. Now, I still do that. A lot of times I will make a comparison of something in the Bible to an event uh, in my own life. That makes me a witness and giving testimony to what the Bible says. Uh, Peter sort of alluded to that in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 when he was talking about how he heard the voice of God say to him and to others, this is my beloved son. And then Peter said, but we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed. And so I like to take something from the Bible and compare it to something else in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah 28 teaches us that we are taking precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And so essentially what we're going to do today is we're going to get wisdom from the Holy Ghost in comparing a portion of Galatians chapter 3 with <laughs> what amounts to like the first five or six chapters out of the book of Romans. So let's get into it so you kind of know where I'm going. Galatians chapter 3 verse 18 the Bible says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? Or in other words, what, what purpose does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Let me kind of back up a little bit. He's talking about the, the Mosaic Law. We know that um, prior to Moses, the law that God gave to Adam was uh, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And at that point, when Adam and Eve transgressed that law, sin entered into the world, the Bible says, in death by sin. So then Abraham then receives his covenant that God said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And we kind of looked at that in the last two pure Bible studies. And then in the days of Moses, God then compounds sin by compounding the law. In other words, sin was multiplied because there was a multitude of laws that God gave that he said, don't break these laws. So instead of in the days of Adam, we have only one law, therefore only one sin. Now we have a multitude of transgressions because there is a multitude of things that God said don't do. Specifically, 10 commandments. God said, don't break these commandments. And we did. And the purpose of that is basically the core of what we're studying today is that God is going to conclude everyone under sin. Nobody is going to get through this life without sinning. That was God's purpose. That's what he intended to do. God knew that it would be impossible for sinful man to perfectly keep the laws that he had given to mankind. God knew it'd be impossible for us. But here comes Jesus Christ. He is the one that though he was made under the law, he took on our transgressions, yet he himself had no transgressions. He had no sins. There was nothing whereby Jesus broke the law. So that makes him eligible, number one, for all of the promises that you see in the Old Testament. And there are a multitude of promises that to, to anyone who keeps God's law perfect, God makes these amazing promises. You know, I like to think of um, places like Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, I think it's good that we strive toward um, not sitting in the seat of the scornful, not going in the way of the transgressors of the wicked, and that, we, that our minds focus and meditate on the Word of God all day long. I think it's wonderful to strive to that, but the truth of it is, you and I have never accomplished that, and we never will. There is one who has. There is one who is the recipient of those blessings that God promised in Psalm 1, and that one is Jesus Christ. He is the tree that is planted by rivers of living water, and he shall bring forth his fruit in his season. And everything that Jesus does will prosper. God blesses it. So then, you and I, when we are in Christ, we now are the receivers of the inheritance and of the promises that God gives to Christ because you and I are part of Christ and in Christ and Christ is in us, then we also are partakers of that blessing. But without Christ, we'll never make it because of the multitude of the laws that God gave, we all are going to be under sin. So let's read that in verse 20. Galatians chapter 3. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. He's simply saying that uh, God made the, uh, the offer, the blessing. Man is the recipient of it, but there is a mediator who delivers the message from God to man. That's what Moses did because Israel in Exodus 19, when they heard God's voice, they told Moses, Moses, uh, we don't want to hear that anymore. It'll kill us. From now on, you go and hear from God and then come tell us what he said and we'll listen to you. So then Moses becomes a picture of Christ because you and I in our sinful state, we do not want to hear God. We are afraid of God because God to us is terrible because of our transgressions. So Christ is the mediator between us and that's what he's saying here. And a mediator is not a mediator of one. In other words, if there's only one party there is no need for a mediator. But now there's two parties, God and man. Christ then is the mediator between God and man. Christ then comes down to us, delivering to us the testament, the covenant that God offers to mankind, which is the new covenant, not the renewed old covenant. Very important to keep that in mind. The Hebrew roots people and the Jewish roots people and all these, they are lying to people. They're deceiving people and making people think that Christ came to place us back under the law of Mount Sinai. He didn't. He comes to us to offer us a new covenant, all right? An everlasting one. So then, verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. There it is. And what we're going to do, we're going to look in Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 5. And I'll be honest with you, I have a lot of scripture here. And as I was going through those chapters in Romans, I thought, man, I can't leave that out. i got to put that in because that's part of it. So we're practically just going to be reading Romans 1 through 5. All right, so if you want to stop this Bible study right now and go read it, really that's all you'll need, all right? But we'll read through it slowly. We'll stop. We'll examine a few things as we move on. We might do this in two parts. We'll see how the time goes. Let's see, what time is it? All right. So anyway, um, God has concluded all under sin, verse 22, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ, see, there he is. Christ is the only one who kept the Ten Commandments. So then he is the inheritor of those promises. Uh, let's see here. Uh, verse 22 again, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Since I cannot perform the works of the law, the only thing that I have is my faith in Jesus Christ that he will carry me from this world to the land of inheritance, to God's promises, not by my works of righteousness, but by the righteousness of Christ 
that is where I put my trust in. I've just, I've just learned in 50 years of life, yes, I'm 50 years old. I've learned in 50 years of life not to trust me. Not to trust that I'm going to wake up every day and I'm just going to perform everything that God demands of me throughout that day without error. I strive for it. I want to daily. There are some days I fall short. That's an, that is an honest Christian. One who openly admits, I don't, we don't have to tell each other every wicked, nasty thought and deed that we, that we, uh, that we do. We don't, we don't have to do that. We give that to God. But we admit readily that it's not by our righteousness nor by our continued living for Jesus Christ that merits us the blessings of God. We're getting those blessings simply because God favors His Son and God has allowed that you and I may be His Son or part of His Son so that we receive those blessings. My faith is not in me. My faith and confidence is not in a church or a denomination or the Holy Roman Pope to give me salvation. My faith and my confidence and my trust is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. So verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And I know what that means. According to Hebrews chapter 12, what that means is, if we will not receive the chastening of Almighty God to us as His sons, that makes us bastards, and we are no sons of God. We cannot be the inheritors of God's blessings if we will not receive His chastisement. And I'm just, I think about this, and I'm just going, why would somebody willingly say, that they believe that they don't receive correction by God just because the clock is or the calendar is at a certain time. I'm afraid that people who believe that, I'm afraid they really mean it. And what that means is, God says, if I can't correct you as my son, then you're not my son. And the word bastard there is used in Hebrews chapter 12. And it, some say, well, that's a curse word. You better believe it is. And it's a very strong one as well. As well, So the idea of a schoolmaster that Paul's saying here is that that schoolmaster, when we were lost, we receive punishment by God. It's not hellfire yet, but it's meant to teach us that God can be mean. He can be cruel. He can be a terror to those who do evil. And it's intended then to bring us to the cross because we realize that we've, we've done wrong. We realize that God not only, not only can punish us here, but he can punish us everlastingly forever. And we don't want that. And so this, the law being our schoolmaster was to, that was the purpose of the law. That's what he was saying here. The law intends to drive us and compel us to go to the cross of Jesus Christ and beg for mercy. And I, I've, seen, I've seen people in courtrooms, literally, sitting in a courtroom, not worried about anything, not scared of what could happen to them. Because A, they either knew they were going to get off, or B, even if they were sent to prison or jail, it was no big deal. They've been there before, they'll do it again. Which means when they get out, they've not been, we call these places correctional institutions. They don't correct most people. Most people just go right back to doing the sins that they were doing. Now, so what we're going to do, we're going to take this then, this idea that God hath concluded all under sin... That would be Jew and Gentile, everyone. And then we're going to compare this spiritual thing with the great spiritual things that are in the book of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 1, let's start there. And again, I had to really work at, 
I wanted to put all of Romans chapter 1 in here, but you read it and you understand why God makes sure that everyone is under sin. Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. And you have to ask yourself, as we go through this list, ask yourself, am I guilty of this? Either in deed or in thought. Because thought sins count too. Thou shalt not covet. Coveting is a thought sin. And while nobody else may know about it, while you may get away with looking at some woman or some man or some object, while you may get away with that, you may get away with the fact that you coveted after that person or those things and other people not know about it, God knows about it. And you'll be guilty. God writes down every act of covetousness that we do. Okay? So we ask yourself, as we go through this list, am I guilty? Have I been guilty of at least one of these, whether in deed or in thought? So number one, all unrighteousness. Number two, fornication. Then wickedness. Well, that's kind of a broad spectrum, isn't it? Covetousness. There it is. Maliciousness. In other words, maliciousness is a, a vengeful thought after, um, let's say that you woke up one morning and you found out that the neighbor's dog tipped over your trash can, spilled a couple of cans of baked beans out into the driveway, and you had to go pick them up. And you've been telling that neighbor, to get your, keep your dog in your house, uh, yeah, to get him off my lawn, okay? And you decide you've had enough. And so you get up early one morning before you know he gets up, and you go over there and kick over his trash can, and you just make sure that you kick trash all over his grass. Ah, teacher, meddling kids, okay? That's maliciousness, okay? That, and that's childish maliciousness, but it's maliciousness, and you're guilty of it. To what degree of maliciousness do we have to be malicious in order for it to be counted as a sin in the eyes of God? Just about any of them. Full of envy. Envy is a thought sin. Envy is related to covetousness and lust. It's a thought sin. Murder. Debate. You know what that is? You gotta argue with everybody. You're never, and you're never gonna be wrong. You're never gonna be satisfied. You always have to get in the last word. That's wickedness. That's unrighteousness. Deceit, you lie. Malignity, you're like a cancer. Every place you go, you corrupt things. Whisperers, secret tellers, okay? Backbiters, gossipers, that's what a backbiter is. Going behind somebody's back to bring them down. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, that's a thought sin. Boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents, without understanding covenant breakers, without natural affection. Um, you don't love your wife, you don't love your children, that's natural affection. My love for my granddaughter that is now in heaven, and I tried desperately after she was born to not get, even before she was born, to not get attached to her. So I never held her, okay? For five weeks of her life, I kept a distance from her. And when she died and I had to bury her, that was the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life was to turn around and walk away from that gravesite. I couldn't do it. And I never held her. You know what that is? Natural affection. I recognized and realized that she came forth from me through my daughter. I'll never get over that. Not this side of heaven. That's natural affection. And I can't understand how a woman can go and submit her body to a butcher to have her child murdered before it's ever born. Where's the natural affection? It's not there. Implacable, unmerciful, 
Uh, that's the list here. And did you know that I've counted this? I've mentioned this before. If you're counting this, starting with all unrighteousness, that's number one, fornication, two, wickedness, number three, and on and on and on, all the way down to uh, unmerciful. There's 23 things here. 23 is the number for death. All right? In fact, look at the next verse. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. And think about it. Uh, Genesis 23. You know what it is? It, the whole chapter deals with the death and burial of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. 23rd book of the Bible is Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, it gives you the things that happened to Jesus at his death, at his crucifixion. Um, I counted those. It's in a book called uh, the King James Code, and I itemize everything that describes Jesus in Isaiah 53. There's 46 of them exactly. 46. That's 23 times 2. It's the number of chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. When a man and woman join together to make a child, he donates 23, she donates 23. Basically, we're passing on death to our children. Boy, this Bible is... Whew. Romans 3.23. Okay? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Okay? And you, boy, there's so much there. But anyway, 23 things here that says that we are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So as we were going through this list, was there at least one thing that you know you've been guilty of? Two things. Five things. Twenty-three? Well, I never never killed nobody. James said, if you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. Well, I never cheated on my wife. Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. And we can do that fairly easily and fairly quickly. We are guilty. God is going to make sure that we are guilty. And that that sin and carrying the weight of that sin compels us then to go to the cross and, and be relieved of that burden of sin and place that on Jesus Christ. To this day, I don't under, fully understand the love of God that He has for us. And, and eternity will not be enough time to praise Jesus for taking our sins from us giving us life everlasting. It's amazing. Uh, by the way, 23rd book of the Bible, Isaiah. In Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66 tells us, uh, which is the last chapter. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there, I, I just had another thought here. This related to that number 23. In Isaiah 66, uh, it tells us in verse 23... And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship me before me, saith the Lord. This is in the new heavens and the new earth, which he says in verse 22. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. Jesus described that as hell. Well, hell is cast into the lake of fire in the last days. And what I think the Bible's telling us here is that we in the new heavens and the new earth would be able to see the resurrected bodies of those who are damned, those who are condemned, and we will see that the fire of their torment is not quenched. And we will praise Jesus for his mercy on us in forgiving us of our sins so that we were not there in that lake of fire. 20, I was just thinking of this, Isaiah 66 the Isaiah's 23rd book of the Bible in Revelation, which is the 66th book of the Bible, it talks about how death is the last enemy that's destroyed. <clears throat> Boy, I love this. Now Romans 2. Uh, this is under the concept God is showing us, and Paul just spends a lot of time showing us that we are all concluded under sin, that there is no None righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, 
whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. You're just, a, you say, ah, look at them. They, uh, they, they drink whiskey and beer. And they do all that bad stuff. Yeah, they're all heathen sinners. Hate them. What sin did you do? Why is it that your sin is far less bad? Terrible English. Why is it your sin is better than their sin? And that's what we do. We condemn others. We judge others. And yet we ourselves are sinners. So he says, Thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Boy, think about that. Here Paul says in Galatians that God has concluded all under sin. God provides a remedy for us, which is Jesus Christ. And yet, and everybody does this. Everybody. We judge others. And we think that because they sinned this sin, that that makes us better. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. I, I, and I have done this and probably will fight off doing this for the rest of my life. What we do is that we demean other people. We put them down, whether they hear us do it or not, but we bring people down because of what we see and perceive that they do. And we do that in order to lift ourselves up. That's wicked. Just because someone, just because they're their body is filled with tattoos and they reek of uh, tobacco and they you can smell the liquor on them and they you can hear the cuss words and you can hear the guys talking about uh, some woman that they saw and you can hear them talking this and talking that and you, and you hear them talking about taking drugs and doing all these things and we look at people like you know us clean cut people with you know nice short hair and we don't have tattoos all over ourselves and we don't smoke and we don't drink and we don't chew and we don't run with those that do. And what we do is that we exalt ourselves because we're not like that. And the truth, and people, look, I know us conservative fundamentalists. I know us. I know what we do to other people. We exalt ourselves because of our fundamentalism, because of our conservative ideas and we do that in many cases, not all, but in many cases, we do it to cover up our own wickedness. We do. Just because your hair is cut short like mine, ladies, just because you wear a long dress everywhere you go, just because you don't say the words that you used to, just because you carry a King James Bible around, does that make you better than anybody else? No, it doesn't. Quit thinking that way. And that's what Paul here is doing. I, I submit to you that I think it's very possible that fundamentalist conservative church members, some of them, will perish in hell fire because they will never be honest with God about their own sins. They really do think they're better than other people. That's not just something that, that's not just something I accuse them of. How do I know this? Because I'm one of them. I am just as guilty as what I'm describing for you because I have done it. And God's chasing me over it many times. Mike, who are you now? What sins have I forgiven you of? What pit did I drag you out of, Mike? If you, I mean, if you had your way, you'd probably still be down there, right? God help us remember the things that He saved us from, the things that He has forgiven us from, and the trouble that we got ourselves into that God had to pull us out. And instead of judging people, 
isn't it better to show them the same Jesus that you and I have seen? Instead of condemning them in order to lift ourselves up, why don't we go to them with a message? At, at least put something on Facebook about the terrible sinner that you are and how Christ saved you from it. That would be a lot better than our judgmental attitude sometimes. And lost people, they despise church people because of it. Okay? Romans 2, verse 12. For as many as, uh, for as, many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another, in the day when God shall judge the secrets, that would be the ones that you have, the secret sins that you have. God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Let me break this down. It was not the Gentiles that God gathered at the base of Mount Sinai, and it was not a Gentile that came down from Mount Sinai with the law and the, and the tablets in his hand, it was the Israelites, the Jews. It was Moses, a Jew, tribe of Levi. And yet, isn't it amazing that everywhere around the world, man and woman still get married, and a man knows that if he goes out on his wife with another woman, a man knows that that's adultery, even if his forefathers were not at the base of Mount Sinai. And if a Gentile steals, when he steals, he knows that he's doing wrong. He knows that if he gets caught, he'll have to pay a penalty for that. Even the Gentiles know that that's wrong. They know it's wrong to curse. They know it's wrong to disobey their parents. They, in fact, in Japanese culture, okay? Anybody studied a little bit, know a little bit about Japanese culture, honoring your ancestors and honoring your father and mother is like one of the top things that they do over there. And they never had Moses as their leader. Never. So what he's saying here is, he said when the Gentiles do, um, when, they, when the Gentiles break the law, even though they weren't given the law, they're just like the Jews who had the law. So, he, and here's what I like. He says, show the work of the law written in their hearts. Okay? I like this. Ten Commandments, right? And you hear me talk, I don't have my model of DNA in here. You hear me talk about DNA and how it's a, it's a double helix and it's twisted. And here's what's interesting. You know, the, the base pairs that join DNA together, all right? You have um, this rung over here, this rung over here, and you have the four base pairs that join it together, all right? When DNA is coiled up, when it's twisted like that, from the beginning of the coil until it goes, comes all the way back around on itself, Okay, that's called one helical turn. It's like turning a, a jar lid, one full turn around. Is that between those two points and that turn, there's exactly 10 base pairs joined together. Okay? It's like God's model. God is showing us that he has written his commandments in our heart. And the Gentiles knew for thousands of years that murdering somebody is a sin, that stealing or lying or committing adultery is a sin, or disobeying your parents. Those things are sins. And so he says, <clears throat> it's written into our conscience. And our conscience then bears witness against us. You've heard me talk about this, about sometimes you can tell when people are lying. Okay? Um, judges do this. Uh, different people who do investigations or interrogations, police officers, they can tell by a person's uh, body language, they call it, whether they're telling the truth or not, okay? I was in on a, a deposition one time, a car accident, a guy hit me, and his lawyer was asking me a bunch of questions, and what he was doing, I figured out what he was doing, is he was trying to trip me up 
in, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, saying one thing against another thing that I said, all right? He was trying to trip me up in it because a person that lies, they have to remember all of their lies in detail. And if you keep asking them questions, eventually they're going to, I remember the word now, contradict themselves, okay? And I, after the deposition, I asked my lawyer, I said, how did I do? He said, you did great, you did fantastic. He said, unfortunately for you, so did the other guy. Okay, and it was, it, I won't get in a situation, but anyway, lawyers, judges, police officers, people, no, parents can tell that their children are lying to them. Why? They look at their body language, look at their face, look at their nose, look at their eyes. Their body will tell, they get fidgeting, a lie detector, basically it's not some magic box. What it does, it measures heart rate, it measures breathing, it measures... Um, the move, the motions of a body. It measures, you know, the sweat that's coming out. Because there are certain things that our body does that witnesses against us when we're lying. Okay? God built that into us. And you're, you're trying to say that you didn't do something or that you're not guilty while your body is telling something else. And he said, um, what's going to happen is your conscience is either going to accuse you or excuse you in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. See, I think it's best that God's people start becoming honest about who they are and even what they're capable of. Maybe not in all the details. We don't need to know every nasty little secret. But I assure you, everybody has them. Everybody does. And God knows it. And one of these days, your secret is going to be out there. And people are going to know who you really are. Unless those sins are covered. Psalm 32 by the blood of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are covered, whose sin is hidden. Blotted out. Man, I like that. Uh, Romans 2, 21. Thou therefore... See, I had a problem in what verses to put in, what verses to leave out, all right? Romans 2, 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Sure you do. Sure you do. So what good does it do for us to judge other people and, and think, or let's say forget about the sins that we committed? the things we may have done even today. Remember, there is none righteous, no, not one, and God has concluded everyone under sin. And the people who I think are in the most danger of God's wrath are the people. And it comes in many forms. It comes in the form of uh, Judaism, the Jews who are practicing uh, and living under the laws of Moses, they've developed such a system to where they break the law through their traditions. Jesus said that. It comes in the form of the Jews or the Hebrew roots or sacred name people or fundamentalist conservative Christians who use their outward appearance as a cover for their inward transgressions. And I think the wrath of God is going to be its most heated state to those who pretend on the outside that they are more righteous than other people, when in fact their inward man is so full of sin, their inward person is so full of sin and so wickedness, so wicked. Like Paul said in Romans 7, uh, there dwelleth in me no, that is in my flesh, no good 
thing. At least be honest. So you can escape the wrath of Almighty God. Now, um, we're going we're gonna to close this down here. Verse 25 of Romans chapter 2. For circumcision verily profit, profiteth if thou keep the law. In other words, he's, he's going to talk about circumcision. And that's what Paul was dealing with in Galatians. Because the idea was, should we make the Gentiles be circumcised? And going along with that then, not only make the Gentiles be circumcised, should they keep all of the commandments, all the feast days, should they live as Jews? In Acts chapter 15, the, uh, the church leaders met to discuss this very idea. And at least they were honest in saying, guys, we never kept the law. Why should we then put that burden upon the Gentiles? Because they won't keep the law either. So why should we tell them, oh, you have to be circumcised, you have to follow Moses, when the truth of it is... We were all circumcised, but we don't keep the law. So he's dealing with circumcision in Galatians. He's dealing with circumcision here in Romans. And what he's going to say is, okay, you that were circumcised, right? Because, I mean, that's the sign that you're children of Abraham. You, you kept the law in that one point. But what if you sin? What if you commit adultery? What if you steal? What if you kill? What if you covet? What if you break the Sabbath day? What if you do that? Here's what he's saying. Verse 25, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. If you're going to do the whole thing. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So should we make the Gentiles be circumcised? When in fact, we're circumcised, but we still break the law. Verse 26, therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. And then it goes both ways. If a man who is circumcised breaks the law, his circumcision is counted as uncircumcision, the sign of the covenant of God. But if a, a Gentile who is uncircumcised keeps the law, should he not been, then be counted as being circumcised? Verse 27, And shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Now we're getting to it. Just because man is circumcised, does that mean he is a keeper of the whole law? No. So it doesn't make any difference what's on the outside. But the man who is circumcised inwardly, and that circumcision basically is, physical circumcision is a casting away of the flesh. Cutting it off, casting it away. What God's going to do with me is He is going to cut off this flesh and cast it away so that this new man can be alive. So watch this. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And see, here's the question. You know, it was easy for Hitler to round up all the Jewish men. They just had to look for one thing, circumcision. But if our circumcision be of the heart, how can we judge someone when we can't see that? I mean, you may see somebody, you know, at the store or the gas station or whatever, just kind of ha having a bad day, lose it, and utter a cuss word. And you say, ah, but they don't go to church nowhere. They're sinners. And yet that may be somebody who is just, the devil has pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, and they just are literally at their brink. And they just, there was that day where they just couldn't take another thing, and the old man came out. You've had it happen to you, haven't you? See, we couldn't really judge that person because we don't know their heart. 
their circumcision has been made not by man, but by God. And it's in the inward man, not the outer. So as far as us in the body of our flesh, this body has been wicked, is wicked, will continue to be until the day that I die or the day that Christ appears. One way or the other, I want this flesh cast off of me and I want to be that new man. He's already there on the inside waiting for the day that he can come out. And some days I groan waiting for that day. So, ask yourself the question, am I really better than anybody else in this world? If you were to be honest, and I want you to think of Think of somebody, just think of somebody you're angry with. Think of somebody that you know that has done you wrong or done somebody in your family wrong and you hate them. You hate their guts. You just are just hoping that somebody does away with them or they have, they have some bad experience in life. You're just hoping that because you hate them because of what they've done. Now think of that person and ask yourself the question, am I any better than that? Are my sins better than their sins? Because who knows? You may be the person that someone else thinks of who hates you because of things that you have done wrong. You just might be that person. In fact, I know it. I know that there are people out there who hate me for legitimate reasons. That was hard for me to say. People out there despise me. Not because of some rumor, but yeah, they don't like me. And there are people out there that don't like you either because of things you've done. So in that sense, we all are the same and everybody be it Jew or Gentile needs the same cross of Jesus Christ God has concluded all under sin so that we all can be approved of God by faith and that's the only way we're going to make it into the kingdom of God and not perish in everlasting fire. All right? Lord bless you. It's been a good day, been a good study. We're going to continue this. We're going to be in, the, you do your own study, Romans 3, 4, 5, uh, connecting it with Galatians 3. God has concluded all under sin. There's much more here that I'd love to dive into. And we'll just wait till next week. All right? God bless you. I love you. Thank you for your prayers for us and your support for us. Desperately needed. May the Lord bless you as he's blessed us. And uh, I hope and pray that we here can always be a blessing to you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.